introduce Marianne Lewitsky. Marianne is an occupational hygienist by training, and she was the founding president of Workplace Health Without Borders, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that engages volunteers in promoting occupational health for workers everywhere. She's currently a senior associate with ECHO Management in Toronto and adjunct lecturer in the Occupational and Environmental Health Division of the Dalla School of Public Health and was previously Director of Best Practices in the Prevention Division of the Ontario Workplace Safety and Insurance Board. Also previously a hygienist with the Ministry of Labour and co-founder of the Toronto Workers Health and Safety Legal Clinic and a member of the Toronto Board of Health. And today she's going to talk to us about uh, rapid testing and its use in prevention. Thanks a lot, Marianne. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, the two previous speakers were terrific and very enlightening. I just realized I can't turn my video on, but um, I will do that later and say hello. Uh, so here's something about COVID testing, uh, especially rapid antigen testing, which we've been hearing a lot about. And uh, I just want to make sure like we, we sort of understand a little bit about it. Uh, it's become more uh, discussed recently, even though the discussions have been going on for more than a year and was perhaps more important before vaccination was available. But with Delta, as we've seen, we still need these measures. And this can be an important measure for uh, source control and making sure that infectious people don't enter the workplace. So uh, we want to talk a bit about different types of testing, accuracy, why they're used, and some of the programs and activities that are going on in Ontario and Canada today. So let's just sort of think of the different types of tests that we talk about and what are some of the differences. So you hear a lot about the RT-PCR test. I'll tell you in a minute what that stands for. And it is uh, the major test. And if you look at this little diagram of a virus, the uh, RNA or the genetic material is represented by the inside of the virus. And that's what the PCR test detects. The antigen tests detect the protein on the outside of the virus. And then we talk about antibody tests, which detect antibodies in the blood that fight the virus and can tell you if you have uh, some uh, uh, immunity against the virus because of previous infection or vaccination. I just mentioned that because it's sometimes confused with an antigen test, but now you can forget about it. We're not gonna talk about it today. So here's some major concepts when we're talking about testing. Uh, sensitivity and specificity, and both of these relate to what we might consider the accuracy of a test. Sensitivity means out of a sample of people who really have the virus, how many will test positive? In other words, if you have high sensitivity, it means you have few false negatives and your test is very likely to catch the people who have the virus. Specificity is kind of the outside and it's represented by these diagrams here. Out of people who really don't have the virus, how many will test negatives? In other words, if you have high specificity, there will be few false positives. So just keep that in mind when we compare tests. So what are some of the major factors in deciding what test you're going to use? Well, a purpose is, is the purpose diagnosing or screening? Diagnosing means you think there might be some reason to suspect somebody has COVID, where screening is sort of like the screening we do in other measures, asking people if they have symptoms, et cetera. Uh, so these different tests are used for those different purposes. What kind of sample are you going to use? If anybody's been tested, you may know there's different levels of nasal swabs or the nasopharyngeal swabs that are sort of way in the back of your nasopharynx. And there's also some tests that can be done with saliva or throat swab, which you might imagine is kind of less intrusive. Obviously, sensitivity and specificity are important. A turnaround time and analysis method and cost, of course, are very important in selecting tests for a large number of people. So here's just a little bit about the uh, RT-PCR test, which stands for reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. And if you, I have on some of these slides, some links to videos, so you can learn all about this. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but generally this is the test that has been considered the gold standard, the one that's used for 
uh, diagnosing people if they have symptoms or they've been exposed or there's some reason to think they might have COVID or they might be required for travel. Um, they're considered much more accurate, i.e. much more sensitive and specific than the antigen tests. They can use a variety of different kinds of samples. And the way they work is they identify the RNA uh, through a reverse transcription of the, if you remember high school biology or you're in, in that field, um, it's a kind of a long chain and it synthesizes DNA and then you get it to trigger a fluorescent signal. So it requires kind of fancy equipment, lab analysis, it's relatively expensive and you don't get results usually. You don't get results right away. You have to wait for several days. So as you might imagine with all these factors, it's not very useful for screening purposes. So then we have the antigen tests. And I have here a picture of a box of antigen tests, which actually I just happened to get. I could tell you more about that later. Um, and what these do is detect the proteins, as I mentioned before, that's on the surface of the virus. It uses antibodies that react with the antigen, so it generates a color signal. And the positive test will be uh, a color signal, which I will show you soon. It can be analyzed right in the same site in which it's done. You can have results in 15 minutes. It's relatively cheap. And it can use nasal or nasal pharyngeal samples, which again, I'll show you a little bit more about that. So those are the antigen tests. You might have been hearing a lot about them recently. Um, so why do we think they should be used? Well, as we know, COVID is very contagious when people are asymptomatic. So the main reason for this is that the screening we do for symptoms, which is very common now, you know, don't come in if you have a cold or a headache or you're nauseous or anything like that, that's not going to catch a lot of the people who are contagious because the most contagious part of the infection is to a great extent before you're actually showing symptoms. So that's what the rapid, rapid antigen tests are designed to screen for. So screening with them can identify people who may be contagious so they don't enter the workplace, the school or other ga gatherings where they can infect other people. They're cheap and quick, so you don't need a lab analysis, and so they're good for frequent screening. Um, but of course, because of that, there's that limitation. It's not good for diagnosis. It's not as accurate as PCR, so it's not to use when you suspect COVID for, say, somebody who has symptoms or has been exposed. And if you do get a positive result with a rapid antigen test, it must be confirmed through a PCR test. So why do we think this is a good idea? So this is a little a diagram. I want to mention the main advocate for uh, rapid antigen tests and like a lot of use of rapid antigen tests. Um, his name is Dr. Dr. Michael Minna. He's at Harvard University and he has been advocating this um, for more than a year now. And this uh, diagram is from a YouTube video which explains this. So I recommend if you want to understand this better, do watch that YouTube video because I'm not going to spend as much time on it. But here's a little diagram they put on the video. So what he says is this, the line here, the yellow line, and tell me if you can't see my cursor, um, represents the amount of virus in a person. And this, uh, the x-axis is time. So the PCR test is more sensitive. It's going to catch people with only this much virus in their system, so virus at this level. That means it's going to catch them at the beginning, that's good, when they're just getting the virus, but it's also going to pick it up when they're at this stage, which is after they've had the disease, the virus is still in their system, but they're still not contagious. So in other words, it's going to pick up a lot of people that don't need to be excluded, that uh, are, are not contagious anymore. It's this phase of the virus, this kind of hump here, with the, where people are contagious. So if you measure with the rapid antigen test and it has this sensitivity at this level, it's going to pick up people with, at the most contagious stage. That's the theory. And also because it's cheap and quick and you can do many of them, you are more likely to get to catch them um, before they can infect others. So. Okay, it's gonna miss these people who are at this stage here. So if you did a PCR test at this stage, you'd get a lot more people 
more contagious than if you did the rapid antigen test. But nobody's going to do a PCR test when you're on this stage because you don't have symptoms yet. So it really doesn't matter that it's more sensitive because nobody's going to test those people. It's too expensive, it's too time consuming, et cetera. So that is the theory behind Dr. Minna's proponent uh, uh, calling for rapid antigen tests. And he's been, I think, a lot of support for him now. So he, what he says is the lower sensitivity is actually like a, a feature, not a bug, because we want to get people when they're most contagious. We don't care about people who are at this stage. Um, now, the sensitivity of rapid antigen tests is actually supposed reported to be extremely good. It's in the 90 to 95 percent range compared to PCR for the most contagious phase. So the likelihood if you do frequent screening is you are going to catch those asymptomatic contagious people. And that's the whole idea. And the specificity is also reported to be quite good. That is, there are a few uh, false positives. OK, so uh, as you uh, after talking about this a lot, Rath, um, Michael Minna and his supporters finally got a lot of support from a whole lot of different organizations, including the Ontario federal and provincial, uh, the Ontario government and the federal government. So now both those governments have programs for giving uh, rapid antigen tests to employers. And they give them free to employers, um, both uh, through a lot of venues. Um, they're also being distributed through municipalities and boards of trade. They're available to businesses allowed to be open in step three and have to have people present. They do advise that vaccinated people should be included because, as, as Gosha showed us, uh, vaccination itself is not enough. We know there are breakthrough infections, so we still want to keep trying to catch those people who might be contagious. Ontario advises testing people one or two times a week uh, during step three. Uh, previously, it was more frequent, two or three times a week. And they do recommend, of course, other prevention must, measures must continue. This is not something that's going to solve all your problems. So what are the conditions for employer participation in that program? They have to register when they sign up to get the free tests. They have to agree to report results to the local public health unit that people who test positive must isolate and get a confirmatory PCR test. You have to treat the waste as hazardous waste. The employer has to appoint a testing supervisor who must be trained, but the training is really minimal. It, it means watching some material that's available online. And to order, in order to make the program more uh, accessible, they did away with the idea that it needs to be a healthcare professional who supervises or administers the test. So I think you can imagine most people would not want a relatively untrained coworker swabbing them. So they also allow self swabbing, uh, but it must be supervised by the designated testing supervisor. And there are videos that show you how to how to self swab. So Ontario reports that 17 million government provided antigen tests, that would be by the province, have been de deployed to 12,400 workplaces. Um, they, they, I didn't find the um, information on how many have uh, actually yielded positive results, but there is anecdotal information that it is being successful in catching uh, infections. And the other thing is rapid tests can be purchased independently. So if you do purchase them independently, um, you, there's like no conditions. I, I, I bought a box and nobody put any conditions on them for me. So I will use them responsibly, I promise, but didn't require that. Um, so uh, how are these being used now? You might've seen recent headlines about the policies being rolled out about um, vaccination mandates. And so unvaccinated teachers now be, must be tested twice a week. Um, at Summit Pharmacy. So pharmacies do uh, provide rapid antigen tests as what I think of as a rather high cost for a single test. But I think the province is arranging that these uh, unvaccinated people covered by the policy would, would uh, get them for free. Um, and interestingly, uh, there are employers that have implemented that pro uh, testing through the uh, province's programs. And recently an arbitrator upheld that it is okay for an employer to uh, require 
people to be tested. So the union had brought a case against that, thought it was too intrusive, but the arbitrator ruled in favor of the company. So again, I just want to reiterate just um, uh, as I said already, the point of rapid antigen testing is identify people who are asymptomatic and may be contagious before they have a chance. So it's really um, in the hierarchy of controls, it's kind of at the top because it's eliminating the virus from the workplace. It's not for diagnosis where COVID is suspected and it's not a substitute for other measures. So here's, in case you're wondering how these tests work, uh, here's the little diagram that comes with the um, uh, Abbott Pan Bio test, which is the kind that's most frequently being distributed by the province. And I won't go through it all now, but basically it shows you how to self swab. You can watch videos about it. Gives you little test tubes with the solution you put in and you put the swab, you just swabbed in your nose, you put it in the solution. And then it has a little device and you have five drops from that solution into a little device and you wait 15 to 20 minutes and then you get a result. And if it's working properly, um, you get uh, two lines if it's positive. And then there's a control line just to show you it's working. If this line is there, but the second line isn't there, then it's negative. So pretty simple. The idea is most people can just learn how to use it themselves. Okay, so what are some of the other uses and types of testing? Well, there's a number of varieties of, of approaches that are being used. And one thing that um, I saw in this headline is uh, Toronto schools are going to be making uh, PCR tests. Remember, that's the more expensive delayed uh, test um, available to schools for them to take home and self sample. Of course, they don't self analyze. They have to send it to a lab, but they can actually take a throat swab at home. And the idea is that last year, um, if any of you had this experience, if kids got sick at school or COVID was suspected or they might have been exposed, they had to go for a test. And we heard stories of kids and families waiting online for seven hours to get their test, and they want to avoid that. So hospitals are making available these at home test kits. You take it home. You can swab the kid at home. Apparently it's a throat swab, and then you can send the sample to the lab and they will analyze it. You'd have to keep the child at home until you had results. Um, now, Kevin, thank you for sharing this paper with me. Very interesting approach, which I don't believe we're doing in Ontario, but the idea is that is pool surveillance testing what was tried in a kindergarten school in Brooklyn. And I won't go through this long thing. I just put it in there to show <laughs> they, they tell you all the details of how they did it. But the idea of pool testing is you don't have to analyze every single sample, which, as we said, is expensive and time consuming. And what they do is they take a saliva sample, which, of course, is much less invasive than a nose sample. And they take one from each person and let's say in a school and they group them by, say, classrooms. So they have all these individual samples, but when they get to the lab, they mix a bit of all those samples for one class together. So they only have to do one test. And if they happen to get a positive PCR result, then they can go back and analyze each of the individual tests so they know which kids are positive. So it's a much more efficient way of using PCR testing. And University of Toronto is doing an interesting approach. And the idea of wastewater testing has been used fairly widely, especially in universities. And uh, COVID is released in human waste. So the idea of this is to test the wastewater to see if there's any COVID in it. If you can sort of isolate that waste from a particular cohort, in this case, it would be a student residence, and you screen that wastewater um, through a uh, through PCR for COVID. So if they do get a positive signal, if there is COVID in that waste, then this whole procedure kicks into action and they start doing rapid, they notify everybody in the building and they start doing rapid antigen screening tests for everyone in the building. And then they can um, find people who are asymptomatic. If it's, if it's negative, well, you're still not out of the woods because we know the sensitivity isn't great, but you have to tell the people to isolate and be vigilant, but that that's kind of, they don't have to go further with the testing. And of course, if it's positive, they have to get a, a 
PCR test. So it's a fairly efficient way of screening uh, for COVID for large groups of people, especially if you have a kind of stable uh, population, in this case, actually living in the same building. So what are some of the concerns worker might, workers might have about this testing? And maybe what are some of the things that workers should be thinking of advocating for if your employer has a rapid antigen testing program? Well, one obviously is confidentiality of health information. Um, the other is paid time for testing. And given that most of the employer programs actually do the testing on site, we would assume the employee is paid for that time. Um, but that is a concern. But maybe a more serious concern is if there's a positive rapid test, what happens then? Like, um, are they paid? They have to go home and isolate and they have to get a confirmatory PCR test. So there's going to be some time that they're in isolation, some time when they go for that PCR test. Are they being paid during that time? Um, and then what, of course, once if it's confirmed that they have COVID, then I guess all the other conditions uh, for people who have COVID will, will kick in. But what happens in that interim time? So that's kind of my overview. And I would be very happy uh, to answer any questions. Thanks for that overview, uh, Marianne. And there are a few questions, although um, Kevin raised the pooling one. I actually talked to people when we participated in the... Um, in the Glo World Health Network's, uh, you know, global summit to end the pandemic, I talked to people from Germany who were using pooled with uh, mm -hmm. kindergarten classes. So they had a class of ten, and every Friday they spit and they, I think, literally were. I, don't know, I kind of maybe it was just my vision that they were. Yeah, all <laughs> that they actually all spit in the same. Yes, exactly, okay. it was, that was my vision too. But when I saw the description of this study, they're actually taking individual samples and they pull them at the lab, which is uh, well, a little more, more hygienic. So, nice. but it, it does make some sense. I don't know if that, uh, um, and I think it is, uh, I think it is a valid uh, tool in the toolbox, um, particularly where workers have to be together with other people, right? Where you don't have other options to protect them or, um, and that kind of thing. So, I'm just checking. I uh, um, is there uh, uh, some of these other questions? Um, uh, well, specifically, what do you think about using them in schools? I think that's is the question of the day or the month. Um, any uh, any thoughts around that in terms in of schools? Levels? I I I mean I think I think it's a good idea. I I, I understand it's being used on a pilot basis. It's been used like sporadically for schools, but not systematically across the province. And it, it is that you mentioned Germany. It is, at least in some of the uh, parts of Germany, certainly being used regularly. So, you know, I know we're all concerned about the kids returning to school, especially those who can't be vaccinated. So I certainly think it's something that we should be, we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, well, Crystal, if you know that, like, I guess it's, it, I have seen it in discussion in the U.S. where the case rates are already higher. So I don't know if any um, school organizations or if, it, uh, if it's all sort of parent volunteer efforts or if there's any been any actual adoption there um, and any any experience of the difference that it's made. Anybody knows that? No. Well, I've certainly heard good things about from Germany, but it, it is anecdotal of people that have, have talked to me about it. Um, and not only that, they provide filtering face piece respirators. To right. Kids in Bavaria. Germany. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Crystal, did you, sorry, I put you on the spot. Um, did, I wasn't sure if you wanted to add anything or not. I see there's a comment from Tracy that they did this testing in their workplace. So it was simple to use. Yeah. That's good. I wondered about frequency. Um, or like, do you think weekly is enough, or do you think because of Delta with its uh, shorter um, yeah uh, window of infection, if it if it's every other day, kind of is required? Well, or? generally, right now, I mean, the province says one to two times a week, so it's probably safer to go for the two times. I know when Michael Mina first started advocating for this, it was two to three times a week, but that was 
pre-vaccination. So, but you know, with Delta being more transmissible, it kind of balances a wash with vaccination. But I would think two times a week would probably be reasonable. And I see uh, Courtney has added it's every 72 hours, which is just oh, slightly three days, um, three more days. different than that. Yeah. Similarly, twice a week. Yeah. Well, pre-vaccination, yeah, that it's an interesting thing. Uh, like, so the vaccination, we know that is protecting the individual from severity, but it's not necessarily preve uh, preventing transmission. So I think that what, I think, my thought is what you're doing, the testing to to achieve is still applicable to vaccinated individuals as well as it is because of breakthrough infections i mean we saw that yeah yeah um and yeah the, the question is if tests can be done at home how can we be sure the results are valid did they do it correctly did they have someone take it for them well that yeah. well we we can't i mean that's why there is this requirement that it be supervised i guess if you're in the employer program so I presume usually you would do it on site and somebody supervising it. And the idea is there'd be the supervisor and the person might self swab, but then the supervisor is there where you put it on the indicator and they would be able to read the indicator. If you were doing it at home, I imagine you could do it through video. So you would have the person watch them swab on video and watch, show the indicator on video. So that could be done. but. That isn't really the way the province intends the program to be used, as I understand it. Sorry, there's another question about the uh, to what extent is fraud a problem with respect to foreign PCR tests used at on entry at border points? Oh, so I'm not sure, Lawrence, if you mean foreign in terms of people took them before they came. Um, or if you mean that somehow the product that is at the border comes from somewhere else. I, I'm, um, but I guess, I, I, I don't know if you know anything about that, Marianne, if, if there- I don't, I mean, there, there would be a possibility of it certainly, but I, I don't know anything about the incidents of it. Yeah, before entry, yeah. yeah. Uh, that makes sense from other countries that, that, that we might have more or less confidence, I guess. Um, and uh, Tom has indicated that they require a person to upload a picture of the indicator with the date on it. Um, yes, so that makes sense. How, how have you actually seen, I guess, I'm thinking about a COVID a workplace safety plan. Um, have you actually seen sort of a section of a COVID workplace safety plan that deals with a testing program and sort of the elements of consistency, confidentiality, kind of that kind of thing. Have you seen anything that, like that's that? That's a very good point. I actually haven't seen one, but you know, I certainly know what I would recommend that it, that it include um, in terms of frequency, protection for employees. You know, one of the things about having a non-healthcare provider um, supervise the test is it raises more of a question of confidentiality. So how are you going to protect uh, people um, again, the handling of waste, I think somebody answered, asked a question about that. Um, they consider it biological waste. So I assume it's mainly because you're mixing people with all sorts of, who knows what germs, it may not just be COVID they have, right? They might have something else. Um, so you have to consider it biological ha hazard as well as there is a solution. I, I actually haven't checked what's in that solution. I wanna look at that, um, but it is expected to be treated as hazardous waste. So you can't just throw it in the garbage. Now, when you buy it yourself, there's no one really supervising you to make sure that you right. put it in the hazardous waste. So it's, it's you know, the person has the responsibility. To, and it does say in the informational materials to treat it as hazardous waste. Mm -hmm. There's a question here, would rapid testing be a viable alternative to demanding vaccinations for workplaces? Well, it is being used exactly like that. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's good or bad, well, I think vaccinations are certainly preferable. Um, but there are some people who cannot be vaccinated. I guess there are some people who will not be vaccinated. And whether you um, allow them to take use rapid antigen tests as an alternative is, you know, depends on the employer's policy. Um, so that is what the province has brought in for education workers. So you saw that that headline there. Um, but that would depend on, on the individual employer's policy. But certainly if somebody had a health condition where they could not be vaccinated, then you would certainly want to do something like that because 
um, you know, there might be a human rights issue if you uh, sort of ignore it, uh, a physical disability. Uh, Tina makes a point, which I think is a good one in terms of cases counted by public health, which ultimately end up being uh, what we're all looking at. And when I showed those diagrams from the national and provincial, um, do I, I, yeah, do cases count when you do those? Is there a place to register the information, or it's only that that's why a PCR is is meant to be exactly mandatory I'm sure. in terms of the uh, employer program, right, that you're going to... Right. My understanding, those case case counts for the province are just um, for those for confirmed PCR. by PCR, but the results of the rapid antigen test are to be reported to the public health unit. Now, oh, okay. what they are doing with that information, I'm not sure about that. And have you ever, like, what does the reporting even look like? Is that an email? Is there a... Uh, no, it's actually in a portal. You upload the results to a portal. With the health get access to when you register in the program. Interesting. And is that uh, personal health data? Personal, like that, yeah. Somebody asked me that because I didn't register for the program. <laughs> I didn't get it. So if anybody knows that, I would like to know that. It's interesting. Does any uh, anybody else? Um, okay. So I guess we have um, all three of our panelists here, and um, I'm I'm not sure if we missed any questions. All along, Sonia's asking thoughts on folks that got mixed vaccination, Pfizer than Moderna, or many people got AstraZeneca than Moderna. Um, and it's been very, I'm not sure who could answer, Goja, maybe you know more from the, um, from that whole UK versus Israel, because uh, that study, I think that Kevin referred to actually shows less waning of vaccine effectiveness in the UK with, the, and they, they, they don't know if it's the AstraZeneca or it's the time between the time interval between the vaccination that may be, have a more lingering protective effect. And I, um, so, sorry, I'm answering the question, which I, 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 Gosha, do you have an answer? Anyone else have any insight into that? And in the mixing part too, of, um, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not. I don't have answers to that and but i remember the from early on the study showing that actually astrazeneca mixed with pfizer with mrna vaccines was more effective than pfizer only um, but i didn't follow up on those studies so those were the petri dish studies i think right where they yeah. were uh, doing um, lab lab based studies yeah well, I, I mean, I'm no immunologist either, so, but I did look at the NACI, um National Advisory Committee on Immunization reports when people were asking that question, when all the people that asked Zeneca were wondering what to do. And they did certainly recommend, they recommended that. And they said what, you know, Gosha just said, it's actually more effective to have AstraZeneca and then a second shot with an mRNA. And they also said that mixing the two mRNAs was, was okay. But if you want to know more, I would recommend reading the NACI um, reports. They're very informative and they're good. Well, and the, the waning of the mRNA vaccines in Israel uh, is still, I mean, that, that's the other sad part, not only that this is potentially the worst way because we've let it happen, but um, that this is one giant human experiment uh, that's going on all over the world with all these different strategies. and. Uh, and none of us signed up for it, essentially. That was part of my question to you, Crystal, around the relative risk of what was acceptable even in your um, in your practice room. So that's adults, right? So they, and they're there to get a degree and they're there to practice their music, which is their life career potentially. So they're gonna accept a level of risk uh, potentially by choice, but children don't have that choice, right? They're not competent to choose. Never mind, we're not letting them choose. So, um, so then, the from an ethics perspective, you would presumably want the relative risk to be lower um, before you put them in a similar environment. I, I just wondered if you'd actually done any of that sort. Of, if the if the model includes any of that kind of element to it. So we were able to consider what the predicted level of risk was for airborne transmission. 
um, and because we were solely applying that to to healthy young adults within that particular context, we've, we've applied it to schools as well. But in many cases, we have strived to just get down to what the predicted zero level of risk would be or sub 5% risk. So really, we're dealing with very low levels. Mm -hmm. And even now with Delta uh, level of inf infectivity in the model, you're able to uh, create environments that are safe enough for them to practice the wind instruments and things like that? We've also instituted a number of other um, controls, so physical distancing um, and a very high level of vaccination. So the student population um, is above 95 and higher uh, percents, uh, and that is a criteria um, for, for being on campus. Otherwise, um, these there is regular PCR testing that is then required of the student body otherwise and faculty. Um, is a question about uh, to the panel thoughts on the economic focus early uh, Ontario reopening plan, uh, bringing public servants back to the office. Um, public health Ontario seems to be silent on the matter. And what is the balance point weighing liberty, economic sustainability versus health? So isn't that that's a, a heavy question, but I guess uh, real easy one. <laughs> Well, I don't know if there's a right answer to this, so I can only give you my opinion. So take, I, I, I think if somebody can continue working remotely, they should. I mean, we're not, we're not near safe enough in indoor workplaces. Uh, we, we need to do all these things to get there, including the, the ventilation and everything else we've discussed. But I mean, gosh, it has shown us it's still happening and, and remote work is one of those measures that can drive down the reproductive rate and if it's possible yes do it that's my opinion yeah and on on the economy and and liberties versus health it's false dichotomy uh because it was shown by many economists already that that the countries with low spread with low case like low number of virus or in, with elimination strategy had better economies than countries that let the virus spread. So there is no, and in, including a person, um, Institute Molinari from France that did this analysis for Canada too. Um, and similar for liberties. I know that now Institute Molinari is also analyzing the civil liberties in this aspect. So actually having less virus is better for, for our freedoms and for for our economy, maybe not for profits of large, super large companies, but the economy measured in GDP is is better. I don't agree with that, but uh, but I, I don't know that it's it's not well understood, I guess. And uh... can I ask a question to Krista? If, uh, yeah, if there's more questions that you want. In the no, queue. go ahead, Marianne. It'd be great. Okay, thank you, Krista. It was so interesting. And one thing that was especially interesting was your indicator that I forget what you called it, but I did take a picture of it um, with the virus indicator, that personal indicator that you have. So, are those available? Great. And the other question is, I know we've used CO two a lot as an indicator of fresh air, but as you said, it won't tell you if the air is filtered. It won't be give you a total picture. So how would you recommend using particulate measurements as an indicator of adequate ventilation? Uh, it's a great question. So so yes, um, we call this a uh, fresh air clip. We also have um, similar versions that we use for, for measuring uh, airborne chemicals. Um, so we're just expanding the, the panel of, of airborne constituents. Um, that we're measuring with SARS-CoV-2, and we're expanding that to to include other respiratory pathogens as well. Uh, this was uh, developed under funding from the National Science Foundation (NSF). Um, so we are we do have expanded use across the U.S. We haven't um, used it in Canada yet, uh, but if there there is an application for it, um, we'd be more than happy to consider how we can make it available. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be great. 
with regard to your your question about um, PM levels, particle matter levels um, uh, versus CO2. So so yes, CO2 have is, has its caveats, um, but measuring CO2 is is very easy to do um, with a low cost commercially available tool. Uh, Particle levels um, can also be used as a proxy, um, and I can uh, put into the chats uh, a preprint of a paper that I mentioned that I worked with with other aerosol scientists where we were looking at different tracer methods that can be used to then estimate air change route, uh, rates within different spaces. Um, so we considered um, use of CO2 to methane to, to particle levels. And so, yes, that, that can be used as a tracer, but we also have to consider the number of other sources um, of PM levels within the space. Um, so we don't have uh, any bias or misinterpretation of the results. Um, so, for example, we, we use that at Yale when we were building uh, a self-constructed, more elaborate um, air change units that allowed for fresh air intake and um, recirculation through a MERV um, filter. Um, and so we had simply lit some, some candles from Ikea um, to generate um, particles. And then we looked at those as a tracer for decay levels for ventilation. I'd be really interested in that. Yeah, I'd love to see that preprint. Yeah. Thank you. So I was just gonna paste in a chat. There was a, that, a good um, webinar on August 18th about Delta and school reopening in the States that Kim Prather organized. And she included in that, there's actually an image from the San Diego school where they have, they've created like a piece of paper that, that holds a CO2 uh, um, meter and a PM 2.5 meter. So it's purple. I don't know. It's a, it's a brand. She's actually recommending that they are recommending being used in classrooms and that, that that everybody can go find it in the middle of the classroom and and um and read the levels um mm. so i i mm. i uh, don't know um i don't know the product but um that there i don't know and i don't know the price point or the as you say the limitations you need you must need to do a a baseline in the room before occupancy mm. potentially yeah. So I, I can elaborate um, on that. So that device is called the, the Purple Air. It's a low cost um, particle air sensor, um, widely used for, for outdoor monitoring. So I have outdoor monitoring networks that we've created um, in different parts of the states. Um, it can also be used indoors. So I also have one set up in my kitchen, um, just as an indicator if uh, <laughs> cooking levels or other sources are, are too high. Um, so it, it can be placed within, say, a classroom or other um, indoor space. but um, the caveat with that is you, you really do have to understand the other sources of, of particles and other uh, combustion level um, that can be present. So it's not necessarily um, bioaerosols or infectious aerosols um, that could be contributing to um, the levels that that unit is being, that is measuring. Uh, when we say low cost, it's slightly more expensive than a CO2 monitor um, on the order of um, 200 to 250 um, US dollars. Um, and I can put a link to the, the Purple Air size. Great, thanks. There's another question about, you talked in your model about masking or universal masking. I think, what did you mean by that? And then someone adds here, I guess in Ontario, masks are required in indoor public spaces, but one of the exception is for workplaces that are not public facing. And your thoughts on, on this, I guess, it's all related to masks and so within the transmission model uh we can look at the effect of masks uh and we do see that as um a, a very large driver for for decreasing transmission risk and an, an easy one um and that's simply just assuming that people are wearing uh, a cloth mask so not even like a an n95 or kn95 um, mask which could have further um, effectiveness so uh, again, when thinking about the uh, the locations, um, the situations where you wouldn't have um, mask usage, uh, again, it comes down to all the other um, uh, preventative and control infectious disease measures that are being taken into account if um, those would be beneficial to layer on. So is the, is the model sensitive to type of like mask versus respirator, I guess, to that you can put in the efficacy of the protection or the um, source control? 
based on the type of face code? So, so yes, most definitely that that can be modified right now. It's within the back end of the model because I had endless number of um, customizations um, oh. that could be made. And when we were thinking about the users um, of the tool, it was a little bit overwhelming. Uh, so I, I paired back on the customization and features, but that's definitely something that that could be entered in um, to say what type of mask um, is being used or other um, respirator. Certainly with Delta, we're trying to uh, recommend respirators for anybody that's potentially exposed to, uh, pe you know, if, it, if it's not somebody in your bubble, then you, and that unless somebody, if everyone's wearing a respirator, perhaps you're protected, but, um, but otherwise you're at risk. Um, and I was gonna ask you, um, obviously you can tell already, I can talk all day about COVID, but um, I was gonna ask you about the restaurant results in your, um, in your fresh air uh, uh, clip study and whether you had brought that to any employer groups or restaurant association or, or how, do, how can we use it to, to drive prevention? Because I think indoor dining is, um, is a huge risk to the people that work there that are in that environment all day long. Um, and I don't think that they're suitably protected anywhere in North America. But I, oh, I, I, I completely agree. Um, I have not been doing any indoor dining and whenever I see it, it sends shivers down my spine, um, uh, especially for, for those that are working there. Uh, so we have not brought this um, forward. Um, we're currently just finalizing the manuscripts, detailing these results. Um, it is concerning. Uh, we had a lot of challenges on finding restaurants that were in the first place agreeable to take parts. Um, and for the most part, the restaurants that we were able um, to have servers uh, wear the clip were more in family run um, organizations that were more attentive um, and responsive if we did say that we saw elevated levels that they would then work with us to to implement different control measures to enhance um, ventilation. But any chain style restaurants, just managers would not return my phone calls um, and yeah, we weren't even able to enter them. those establishments. I've got, a com I've got a comment here. So moving forward, you know, if there's kind of like follow up work, with um, workers in restaurants, it would be really good to monitor to say what kind of face covering they're wear wearing and even sort of correlate, you know, the number of um, COVID cases based on, you know, what's being measured and also the, what respirator, where the respirators are being worn, for example. We did collect um, uh, a number of different parameters from the, the participants asking them uh, how long they spent uh, wearing the clip in the establishments, um, there were some questions about um, other types of infectious control measures that were implemented. Um, we knew where the establishment was, so we knew the building characteristics, um, and we are relating that to the local um, case levels. And uh, one of my collaborators working on this is very active in monitoring um, wastewater and sludge, um, so we have that type of information to pair as well with when we collected and where. Interesting. Thanks. Oh, one more question. I guess I, I was interested in your work at Yale itself and saw a headline or a tweet yesterday about parents uh, choosing colleges based on IAQ now. And and I'm actually we're in the midst in in the Hamilton Clinic trying to. Um, to, to determine what the HVAC system ought to look like in our in our new facility that we've just moved into, with, you know, um, and it, the HVAC system is being remodeled for us, um, but what that is actually meant to look like. Um, so I'm interested in, uh, um, I guess, yeah, the level of adoption at Yale, whether it, there's any measurable difference in uh, in. in um, cases in at universities that are are adopting ventilation measures and control measures like you've described u of t has um advertised i think and uh publicly declared they they have five to six air changes in all their classrooms um which is great um, meanwhile mcgill isn't doing anything we hear which is another canadian university in in montreal so i just i guess 
looking for your personal experience and anything else, I guess, in terms of the adoption in higher education um, where people should know better, right? They should understand the science and they have, uh, you know, people um, in their facilities who can explain it to them. Any comment on any of that? And if I can just add to that too, Val, um, you know, your experience with, um, you know, air purifiers as well, I'm, I'm layered on top of that as well. And whether, um, you know, do it yourself, air purifiers are started to be used in colleges and schools, but from, the, from what you know. Uh, so, so, yes, I, I have heard from a number of my collaborators, especially at Canadian universities, there's been a huge discrepancy even in the States on, on what's being done. Um, so, the, the Office of Facilities at Yale has been absolutely phenomenal, and I've been working with them since the start of the pandemic, um, looking at the various building spaces we have gone through together. Um, individual rooms that are deemed to be higher risk because of um, the type of activities um, in place, be it um, more different types of arts and drama, um, all the, the music uh, related venues and spaces um, to ensure that the level of air changes per hour are adequate and the amount of filtration um, within those spaces is also sufficient. So the entire university is upgraded to, to MRF 13 filters um, we've gone through all of the, the buildings with active CO2 monitoring as well, so that it is all online. Um, but that, that does vary university to university, and I will put the preprints um, link into the chat, and that's been a number of other um, US universities that have been incredibly proactive in working with their aerosol scientists um, to, to recognize the value of indoor air quality, um, not just for COVID, but for a number of other long-term um, related health. Um, with regard to the use of, of air cleaners, especially DIY, that really comes down to the building itself. Um, so within some of the older buildings on the Yale campus, there have been um, uh, consideration of the supplemental um, standalone air cleaner units, um, but it's really space dependent um, if they're being um, implemented. Great. Thanks. Well, I, we are just after 3, I wanted to give each of you an opportunity. If you had had wanted another few minutes, just upon reflection of our discussion and, and your presentation. And I guess the theme of Delta is different, or it's just really, you know, we're, we're here again and, um, and what, you know, what can we do to, um, to prevent things or to at least, um, make it. Better or to optimize any um, any approaches, particularly in workplaces, that is our theme, but also um, in communities and in our province and uh, and elsewhere. So I don't know if anybody, I Gosha, we'll go in order of uh, of, of speaking. Um, oh, I like that one. This is the best webinar in the series. There's a good comment out of sixteen <laughs> webinars. Um, so Gosha, do you uh, do you have anything you want to add before we wrap up? Because now I'm involved in advocacy a lot, and I think it works. So if we want to make workplaces and our life places safe, we need to advocate. Like we need to write to school board, like from the lowest level, so school boards, municipalities, MLAs, and and then federal government, and raise our voices that we want safety, that we want to be safe in Canada. And so I, I think that's like since last two weeks that for me, that's the most important uh, part. And then, of course, educating about, about air, airborne transmission and rapid tests and basically all the tools that we can use to reduce the numbers and reducing the numbers is also like should be the, the goal of it, because like using tools when then we stop using them and letting the virus spread again. And now we should focus on preventing the fifth wave. Because now is the time when we can prevent it. So fighting fourth one, but preventing the fifth. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me. That was that was a that's a, that was a great webinar. Thank you. Too. Okay. Crystal, do you have anything that you wanted to add? We've covered so many topics. I I, I will just note if, if anyone is is keen to to see any of the resources that that I've listed, I I will send a copy of my slides out um, and also include um, an open link to the the spreadsheet tool. 
Um, um, so please do reach out if there are further questions. Great, thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for uh, for being here and uh, asked you many questions. And, and we we always have more. Uh, that, that's the other nature of the audience is that uh, that we're that everyone who, who's here is cares and they're passionate about trying to make a difference um, to workers and workplaces. Marianne, did you want to? Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. This was a, was a great webinar. I really appreciated the other two presentations. And you're right, Val. It's kind of like here we are again. We never thought that after all the vaccination, we would be here again, and we are. So we have to learn from this whole experience. And I think one thing, you know, certainly the air, airborne transmission, not only the fact that it is airborne, but the whole experience of you know, how we believe things are transmitted, how we're set in the ways of things we learned in school 50 years ago. We need to all have open minds. I mean, I've had no, I mean, I've, I've said this about other people, but I've had to have an open mind about non respirator masks. I mean, I, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was telling people they don't do a thing. Well, they do something, right? Um, so we all have to learn from this. I mean, and especially all the things that are used to, control airborne transmission will stand us in good stead for other yes. airborne diseases, not just COVID. Yeah. Uh, so we need humility, we need to learn, and everything else I agree with what Kasha said. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, I concur with all of that. And I, I was actually in uh, just thinking this morning about next, uh, we, we do have, we're planning one in two weeks. I'm sorry I didn't get it up on the Eventbrite by today, but it will be focusing on schools um, and education and focusing on the on children's health, but what we can learn from talking about their ergonomically with respect to the chemicals they're exposed to, with respect to um, the ventilation um, and also masks or respirators, but it's all, First of all, schools are workplaces, so it all has an impact on those who work there, and then it's all translatable um, into other workplaces. So that's happening um, in two weeks on the twenty fourth. But I, and was if I could just, if I could just add a sweetener. Um, so Jim Rosenthal's agreed to talk. So you know, with the do it yourself uh, box fan filters, um, it's the Rosenthal Corsi box fan that um, it's the model, it's the design. So it'll be well worthwhile just listening in, thinking about how you can do this yourself. I did it this morning, so it's quite easy to, to, to make your own air purifier. And Kevin, I should have asked you if you had anything else you wanted to add or in the wrap up. I just think there's an example there that something, you know, everyone on this call and this, this um, in this um, webinar could find out a bit more about the do it yourself and think about applications where they could use it, you know, donate one to the, the their own school um, and get it put in their kids' classroom, but just to sort of send the message out. And that goes back to the advocacy piece as well. You know, we're all advocates. Um, if we wait for things to come down from the upper epsilons of the government with all the different layers, we might be waiting a long time. So yeah, Val's, Val's also I got one, put one together too. My husband put one together while the uh, debate was on last night, so he had a task. That was a good use of your time. <laughs> Do you have the link to the recipe how to make this uh, Corsi box, Corsi Rosenthal box? Uh, I think if you do any search, there's Clean Air Crew is a website that has a lot of information. I don't know if you, we, um, do you have it handy? In there. Uh, I, I was going to say, and then then we'll, we'll let people go, but I was reflecting on something else we could do in October would be around the humility aspect that you uh, raised, Marianne, because that's what we've run into so much, not just, it's not just dogma, right. it, it's the resistance to being able to say, oh. oh, I was wrong, you know, but, and and we've learned something together and together we the can double make chocolate cookie. Mm. Sorry, I'm not sure who's got their microphone. Um, great. Oh, Crystal, you put in a link, but that's not the one specific to the uh, Corsi box. Is it in there? There is instructions for the, the four sided, five sided um, unit. Yes. Yeah, that's what uh, we, Don, Don made a five sided, but we. Uh, I'm also going to put in the World Health Network uh, has a number of resources for schools and communities. Um, as well. 
So um, I think with that, we probably should say goodbye and let everybody go and start their weekend. Um, and we'll reconvene in two weeks and uh, we will post the uh, slides probably on Monday um, when Bonnie is back and we will edit the video so it'll be by speaker as well as the discussion. Um, but in the meantime, I had put the link uh, at the beginning um, and I can fetch it again. Our YouTube channel. Um, just a second, I just have to find it here. Are you or not? Are, are, it will be on YouTube as a playlist, but right after the session, because we've been broadcasting live on Facebook, the video will be there um, as of as of, you know, half an hour or 20 minutes. That's all it takes for it to render. And then the video for the full session will be available over the weekend if anyone wants to um, wants to share it with people. So thank you for everyone's time and thank joining you. us. And thank you very much again to our to our speakers, Goja, Crystal and Marianne. And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks.